Uh, thank you all so much for coming. Um, we're going to be looking at the New Zealand Cemetery uh, collection and as you know, as you will hear later uh, about the, uh, the collection being online. And I want to introduce you to the speakers today, which will be myself and Diane Wilson, uh, Vice and President, yes. and also Ben Mercer. Ben, and Ben is, has come over from Australia, <laughs> and he is uh, representing Ancestry.com, uh, and uh, he will be uh, participating during the week, as I will be, in at the Auckland Library, and I have the program here if people are um, interested in that. They're every day of the week tomorrow, looking at shipwrecks and the Napier earthquake, and Wednesday the flu epidemic, and Thursday how you use um, uh, the um, records, burial records, and how you find things. And I'd also like to introduce you to Nicholas, Nicholas O'Flaherty, uh, who is from uh, Camino. Uh, you call yourselves Just Camino? Or Camino? Yes, no, Just Camino. Uh, who uh, are, do the publicity for um, Ancestry. So uh, I think we can just get started. Uh, and so we've got, um, obviously, as you can see, the presenters that are um, myself and Diane. And what we're going to do today is firstly go through the history, a little bit of background that some of you will know well, others of you may well not know at all, and then why we did it. Why on earth do you go out and scrape and be in rain and fall in graves and do all sorts of things to record material? Uh, how did we do it? and then uh, changing formats over time. So how we've recorded them and what we actually have available, who has the records now, and then leading up to our fantastic uh, agreement with um, Ancestry to license the records so that they are online and people can see them all over the world. Okay, so let's uh, talk a little bit about the, the history. Um, this all began for the NZSG by a gentleman called Peter Hunter in 1967 and he lived in the Wairarapa and he started transcribing records and he did it because he thought we've got to actually preserve these. You start to see uh, headstones that fall over, old stone that wears away and you can't read and so we needed to do something about it. And as you know, the NZSG began in 68, in, um, uh, and uh, we've then gradually throughout the country, people picked up the idea of uh, getting these records together and making them so that we had them for uh, people from um, here on in. And today we have a national collection, and this is from cemeteries up and down the country, and it means that people who have perhaps died in one place but are buried in another place, you don't waste a heck of a lot of time looking all over the place, but you can actually find them. I think I've got the number of cemeteries a little bit inflated. Someone said to me they're probably more like 13.5 or something like that, but of the ones that we've got on, on our records. And they include a lot of the public cemeteries, and we still have some big cemeteries yet to, to do, and some private cemeteries, little cemeteries tucked away, and then of course a lot of the um, Maori Europa that we haven't necessarily been able to get all on online. And the records that we have uh, go up to 2007. So there's a lot of material to be updated from 2010 on and we're going to be putting out a call for people to help us do that so that we can uh, include and keep on with that uh, particular record. This just gives you a map of the districts as used in the collection and you can see on the blue on the other side it's all been divided up <coughs> and this is how NZSG have divided them. This isn't how the councils have or doesn't link to, count to counties or different parts or electoral areas or whatever, but it's just the various areas which enable you then to look in our cemetery books and uh, find out where those particular cemeteries um, might be. So why did we do it? 
well. Firstly, we did it to preserve the records, to protect them. And of course, sometimes we had to do it to correct them because you'll find over and over that people have people recorded not perhaps in the right place or the spelling was not done right. Uh, and so we've got things that are, uh, need over time to be uh, changed. And of course, to save the records uh, from vandals. Um, the Lanark Memorial is a really good example of that. It's now been preserved and beautifully uh, uh, redone, restored. Uh, and uh, there was one uh, cemetery I was reading about the other day where 40 graves were just knocked over by vandals. They couldn't take them away because they're too heavy, as we all know, but they could just push them over or bash them with a hammer or do something uh, like that. So we need to save those records. And uh, as you'll hear uh, later, and particularly during the week, because we didn't start till 67, some of the things that happened before that uh, we have not been able to preserve, and that's a shame. And of course, then the biggest example for those of us now to remember is Christchurch and the um, Bambas um, uh, Cemetery there, where things have all been pushed over, but we have the records because it was transcribed prior to, to the. We also want to do it so that it can be provided and provide access for our NZSG members, and then of course also for the wider public. Uh, because our objectives as a charitable organisation is not just to focus on uh, our members, but also to provide and educate the wider public. And that's one of the other reasons that we can provide access. And that's where uh, having them online will provide access to a huge number of people who haven't been able to see them before. We do it because we want to find our own families. We want to say, okay, where were they buried? Can I go there and see, is that um, memorial or plaque or headstone, is it in need of restoration? Or can I just go there and just smile and have a cry and just see just how it is? We do it so that we can help others find their families. And as you know, we have a research service where people can write in and say, you know, can you help me? I'm trying to find my family. I don't know where they are. And of course, we do it to add valuable clues for further research. Because people will often see a headstone and it will say, born in some place in Scotland or something. And they say, I never knew that but it's on the headstone, or there might be names on the headstone that you never uh, knew about. So it provides us uh, with these really significant um, clues. Now I want to hand over to Diane. Diane is the Queen of Cemetery Burial uh, <laughs> <laughs> Collection and can tell us all about how, the, uh, how it was um, put together, etc. So, gosh, that's a build up, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Don't. No, <laughs> oh, Queen of Cemeteries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. well, yes. I'm not too sure about that. Um, how did we do it? So usually, and, and always what we do, we start with asking permission of the sexton, the vicar, whoever owns the cemetery for us to be allowed to go and work in the cemetery. We, I have been involved in the work in three cemeteries, one particularly large, one small cemetery, and one which was a Māori Urupa. Now to get permission and to make sure that everyone was happy with us transcribing in the Urupa took a long time. It often took a two and a half hour telephone call until we could build the confidence and the trust that we were allowed to do it. And it was to me a very great privilege and quite an honour that we were allowed to do Mangari Piriti Urupa. To you, it's probably known as the St. James Mangari Churchyard Cemetery, but that is its correct name now as the Mangari Piriti Urupa. When we start, we should try to survey the cemetery, try to find if there's some burial plans. Often there's not. And when we're that, then we have to start at the front gate. And we say the first plot on the right is number one, and when you go through looking at some of the records, you will see that they're numbered 1 to 300. That means that probably there was no burial plan available at that time 
It may have been found since, but that's why they are numbered that way. We've transcribed in round hang or shine. Let me tell you that this is not a fashion parade performance. <laughs> you need gum boots, you need a bucket, you need some scrubbing brushes, you need things like that. But we did go and particularly at one cemetery where we went every Saturday for five years until we had it done. It was every, and as well as that, we were working every Wednesday morning creating some records. We did it in groups and it was a tremendous amount of fun. We would have to carefully trim extra vegetation. Some families plant a tree on their grave and this is, sounds really lovely, you know, it would be nice for Aunt Aggie to have a whatever. But those trees grow. And in the end, you almost feel that you're in the Amazon forest in some cemeteries, and you're having to take off vines and plants and things. And that takes a, lo a lot of effort. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's difficult to read what's on the headstone. We have been known to be lying on the ground with a mirror, mm -hmm. trying to capture the light to shine it on the headstone to be able to see what, what the actual words are. And sometimes you're very grateful to the fact that a headstone will start in loving memory of. Mm -hmm. Of your charity, pray for the repose of the soul of. Mm -hmm. Sacred to the memory of, and you think, goodness, at least I've got the first line. <laughs> and from there, you're able to work out the various words, but you are having to lie <coughs> there or work away. But we worked quite happily doing this. We, ne we never used scrapers and we didn't use bleach. And people say, why didn't you do that? Because bleach will ruin the stone, and scraping you can scratch it and then that won't do any good. However, we were very damn hands at using talcum powder, and let me tell you, shaving cream is very good, <laughs> but you must wash it off when you leave. <laughs> Otherwise, that is more damage the stone. Sometimes we had to get extra assistance. And in one particular cemetery, there was a very, very large headstone, which was obviously ornate, and it looked very valuable, so therefore it must have good information on it. The sexton came down with his front head digger and two men, and we overturned the stone. So he came away saying, no stone has been left unturned. <laughs> <laughs> we worked in pairs when we were doing it. We always had our trusty clipboard and a pen. One would be reading what's on the headstone. One would be writing. When it was finished, the one that was writing would read back what they'd written, if they could. And then you would check to make sure that it was right. In one cemetery, while we were doing it, we had a tremendous amount of fun. And it's very pertinent that this morning we should be eating muffins because muffins became part of the fun of this cemetery. We became really quite adept at making muffins. Viv, whose hair was a dab hand at double chocolate, and I did a very, very mean lemon syrup muffin. <laughs> In fact, the muffins became very, very much part of our, our thing. When you're doing a cemetery, you are always desperate for money. You need money for paper, you need money for discs, and there's always a, a difficulty to have money. So we produced a muffin book. For those of you who are long-time members, you'll remember being made to buy one of these. <laughs> they uh, cost, I think, a whole $10, and through that we were able to finance the transcription of the cemetery. They were done on pink paper and in red printing because we knew that no one would and forget which book it was. When it was <laughs> so that was our cemetery and, and our socialising and things. This here is just to show you <coughs> the plan of a cemetery if you are lucky <coughs> enough to get some burial records. And the other one is just some of the sort of things that a, a gravestone can look like before you start to transcribe. Sometimes they're completely covered in vine. And I don't know if you noticed on television <coughs> last night, I was scrabbling around like a chook, somebody said, uh, <laughs> pulling them out. So we, we've got our headstone done, we've worked in pairs, we've checked the data, we've read the stone, we've gone back. And now we're going to go home with our transcriptions and we're going to type it up. 
1967, I'd like you to think about this. We did not have a photocopy. Remember that? Everything was done on an Imperial 66 typewriter only with three carbon copies, or four. And if you're unlucky enough to get the fourth copy, you probably couldn't read it. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the original books, if you have a look, are actually done on the typed, and it would have been done with carbon paper. It seems quite to me quite extraordinary to think about life without a photocopy. That's what did happen. We've, then we're having typed up the data and gotten it into a, a form. We then had to prepare an index because remember, then there were no such things as automatic indexing when you're using an Imperial 66 typewriter. <laughs> so we had three carbon copies and we were hand creating indexes. It wasn't terribly easy. Um, and now we photograph the headstones, enter and check the data, it's all done off site. So I'd like to talk about what we, how we actually started and what we did. We would have started with card indexes in the drawers, remember? Mm -hmm. All handwritten and you scrambled through to find the one you wanted. Then there was very exciting, you printed it out and you got it into the book. And there it is on the fine paper, so you could do the carbon copies. That was step, another step. Then the big excitement of when we got to microfiche. The pages were laid out into so many, you know, lined and they were lined up, filmed. And this was a tremendously exciting because <laughs> it meant that we could send microfiche to people cheaply and anyone around the country that had a reader could use it. And this was a very exciting. In 2000, no, 1993, there was a confish method used. And I don't know how many of you are aware of it. But from perhaps changed from having to print out and then photograph the uh, data, it could be done straight from the computer. And I can remember seeing the very large backup tape not a disc tape, which went to the bureau, and then from that the confiche were the fish were automatically created. So that's computer to fish, and we thought this is it, this is the end. And then computers came, and then all the different programs. One cemetery we had to have a specially written program for us, and now we use Excel, and it's just wonderful. How do we produce them? We produce them. And do you know I haven't got a floppy disk, but do you remember the big old mm -hmm. floppy disks? And then we went to a smaller floppy disk, which was like this one. The excitement of that, wasn't it, to have a disk? 3.5 oh, megabytes. <laughs> yeah, what was the other one? What was the size of the other one? Yeah. I, I, I just remember them yes. with horror. Yes. And we then have one for a we've gone to DVD and, and to flash drives. We've done, as, as we've gone through, yeah, look, dear little flash drives. I mean, aren't they wonderful? Just think, what's on that flash drive would take you several of these to achieve. And then we have, as well as doing this in our cemetery collection, we have produced what we call our burial locator, which is, is a slightly different product, but it shows you people <coughs> and gives you the opportunity to find them wherever they are in New Zealand. Because people will not die where you expect them to. <laughs> they, <laughs> they are very, very naughty. Uh, particularly you get someone who has been living in Hamilton. They come up to Auckland Hospital because they're very ill. They die. They take the body back to Kaikoui, because that's where the family comes from. But you know they lived in Hamilton, so that's where you're looking for them to be buried. It's very, very untidy. <laughs> and so now we've moved to online. And this is for us is a very exciting step, that now everybody should be able to look and find their families. <laughs> how you do it. So then we're just going to do a quick um, summary of where these records are, are found now. 
They're in our library at BFRC. Um, they're in uh, the NZSG archives. They're in individual homes, boxes. I've been up around to Diane's. There's all this collection on, on the microfeatures, etc. They're in other public libraries um, and heritage repositories all around the country. And of course, municipal councils and local board have their records, many transcribed and now updated by NZSG members. And every time I go and look at them, I say, thank you so much, whoever you were, that actually put that together and made that, uh, that record um, available. Uh, in our library, we've got the cemetery books in hard copy, as you can, you can see. Carbon copy on these ones, and this one a little bit later, which has actually typed up there. Uh, and the microfiche, as, as Diane has showed you. Uh, and then in addition, there are books about special cemeteries and graves. And of course, we have to remember that it's not all online, great that that is, there are other sources as well that we have to just remember from time to time. Wonderful funeral directors' records, um, bur the burial locator CD, thank you very much to the Chocolate Fish team, and our online um, sites. And so uh, the, we just now remember that now that they're on Ancestry, the value of a national product um, is borne out by remembering, as we've said before, our families don't have a habit of dying alphabetically, or chronologically, or indeed geographically. And so by having available this, it really uh, the challenge of finding your family's deaths and burials is made just so much easier and the chance at last to have these records online um, is well overdue. So we say thank you to Ancestry for helping us with that. And now, Ben, would you like to come and have I'd a love chat? That. <laughs> thank you very much, Guy. I suppose today it's not me really um, talking about uh, a collection that you spent decades um, producing. It's, it's really me uh, being here today to say thank you uh, for producing such an amazing collection. Um, and listening to Di talk about uh, the trees that grew out of the graves, it, uh, it made me think about why we do what we do. Um, it's exactly that in the virtual world. So we take records uh, from societies like yours and we take them on site and people then come on and search those indi individual collections and out of those individual collections a family tree grows. So the cemetery collection that uh, we've worked on together to take online um, will enable you know, thousands, tens of thousands of New Zealanders uh, and other uh, people across the world um, to basically grow those family trees from the individual records. So it really is me saying thank you today. Um, there are sessions later in the week uh, that talk through the collection that you can hopefully come along to and we can uh, together work out how the collection actually works on Ancestry, what it looks like. And the huge benefit that it will be uh, to not just New Zealanders, but the, the whole world. Because um, this is a platform, Ancestry is a platform that um, has uh, a reach that goes across um, all of the countries in the world. So what was really nice also was you talking about this guy. Um, because this is effectively what we do. Um, we, we come and work with, uh, collaborate with uh, societies like yours and we help to preserve uh, the collections, provide access to the collections. But we, we like to think of ourselves as the people that fund that preservation. So we're really just um, so an organisation that comes along and, and helps you um, sell muffins. <laughs> <laughs> But it's, it's exactly what happens in so many of the societies, both here in New Zealand and in Australia, um, to fund projects like this. And what I've enjoyed in the last year or so that I've been with Ancestry, and I'm sure what I'll enjoy doing as uh, um, the various collections get updated uh, by the society, is, is 
allowing the, um, the organisations to uh, develop those collections. So we, we've got a base collection, a really amazing national collection that Gay talked about that covers so many cemeteries across the country. But I know you're, you're working on updating that. So I look forward to uh, collaborating with you on, on that update as well and making other projects possible uh, by helping to fund them. Uh, and also helping to provide the, the expertise and the, and the resources that we have over in the US that allow that digitization process, that indexing process um, to happen on a grand scale um, and to happen quickly. So please join the rest of you, have a chat and have tea and muffins, coffee, uh, water out in the, the foyer there. And thank you very much again for coming and hope we see you during the rest of the week.